Turn your Bibles to Psalm 58. We're de dealing with another miktam of David. Psalm 58. If we were to title it, it would be a miktam for justice. A miktam for justice. Notice, beginning with the introduction, to the chief musician, Al Tasheth, miktam of David. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, Charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Well, that sounds kind of violent, doesn't it? This guy's getting down to some serious praying right here. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous, Verily, he is a God that judgeth the earth. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus and how we pray that you would use this psalm to teach us something, one, about praying, teach us something about justice tonight, teach us something about proper praying concerning the wicked, and to have your heart and mind toward righteousness and true justice. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Obviously, from the introduction, the human author of this psalm is David. We know the actual author of the psalm is the Holy Spirit of God. For holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But he used David in this. And it's called a miktam of David. Now, when he begins it, this is one of those, this is one of those psalms that is written to the chief musician. And being a miktam of David, basically a golden writing, a special writing, one of those one of those psalms that was especially special to David as he wrote. It was one of those things that was to be sung at the, sung at the temple. As a matter of fact, when he uses the term here, Altashis, that is not the name of the, uh, of the, mu of the musician that he is giving this to. Uh, instead, the word has the idea of destroy not. In other words, this is a very special psalm to David, one that he once sung over and over again, yea, even in the temple about justice. Now, there's uh, differences between the miktams. There's only six miktams in the 150 psalms that are in the Bible. Uh, all of them by David. The first one is found in uh, Psalm 16, a miktam of David. All it says, there's no occasion given in the writing of that particular one. And in that one, it talks about the godly man. It talks about his portion. It talks about his practice and the prospects of a godly man. The other five are beginning in number 56, then 57, 58, 59, and 60 of the book of Psalms are all together. The first two have to do with David uh, being in great trouble. In number 56, Psalm 56, uh, David is surrounded by the Philistines. He's in their city. They could take him easily. And yet he declares his trust in the Lord to take care of him and get him out of there. And then in Psalm 57, again, he's in a spot. The only thing this time, it's not in the Philistines. Uh, this time he's in the cave when Saul was in the cave. Remember, uh, we had twice that David's hidden back in the cave and Saul comes in and actually sleep, sleeps for the night. And some of his soldiers are with him and they easily, if they'd just gone a little deeper in the cave, they could have found David. And, and David makes it very plain that he is going to be steadfast in his trust for the Lord. He's not seeking. I mean, he could have went in and probably taken out Saul. Uh, Saul was seeking to kill him and nobody would have found fault with him except the Lord would have found fault with him. 
He just put his trust in the Lord that God would take care of him. He was steadfast in that. So Psalms 56 and 57 uh, show us David's decision to trust God no matter how dark and dire his prospects of survival would be. You get to this one now, and he does not give us an occasion. As a matter of fact, uh, this being a psalm that's to be sung in the temple, um, this psalm takes a different turn. Matter of fact, it's very difficult to find under what occasion that David would have written this particular song. But obviously, he is troubled about the judges and the people who have control and justice. Now, let's face it, there's not much justice in America. Not any true justice, not justice according to uh, the way uh, God tells us about just, justice. And David has a desire for true justice. We have a broken justice system. It's been broken for some time. May I say, by the way, that all peoples in all nations have had broken justice systems. And it begins, of course, with, from the heart of man because man is a sinner. Now, there's not going to be any broken justice when Jesus is reigning and ruling from Jerusalem, for he will rule with a rod of iron. And, of course, he will see to it that true justice is what's meted out. There was an article in Time several years ago that reported that one offender, 20 years of age, was sentenced to 25 years for stealing $10 worth of beer from his neighbor's garage. The same judge on the same day uh, passed a sentence to another person who happened to be a motor vehicles official. He was accused of, embez of embezzling $8,000, and that same judge gave that man five years probation. Time reported that because obviously there was a breakdown of the whole justice system. And we could see inequities like that throughout the justice system in America today. Our justice system is broke at the very highest levels. I, we had a great example of that again, where you've got the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court wrote the deciding opinion, break, knocking down the law against abortion in the state of Louisiana. His decision will cause the death of whole, how many thousands of babies? His decision will do that. And may I just add this? The majority of those will be minority babies. No justice. Justice would protect the innocent. And there was no justice. You realize at one time on the Supreme Court, we, there were seven of the nine justices had been appointed by Republican presidents. And they still couldn't overturn turn Roe v. Wade. Still couldn't do it. Because a whole lot of those people aren't what they either said they were or decided that they were going to rule, not according to law, but they were going to rule according to their whim. No justice. Well, David looked around and he saw justice being violated all over. And so uh, David's going to say something about those who violate justice, those who uh, have the responsibility to mete it out, but then they don't do it. They don't do it justly. Their justice and judgment is broken. And then he's going to pray about those people. And then we'll see the response that if that prayer is answered, that the just should have toward it. So we see, first of all, justice violated in verses 1 through 5, when he says, Oh, do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work witnesses. And that is the heart of the problem. Ye work wickedness, ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they're born speaking lies. Their portion, or poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. He, so he starts out by asking some very searching questions. He starts out, and this is directed to both the congregation and to the sons of men and to the wicked. All three groups are mentioned. He says, number one, do you speak righteousness. What comes out of your mouth? Do you speak righteousness? And I think it's obvious from the tenor of the entire psalm, but especially these first five verses, that the answer was, no, they did not. You know, we have to be careful. We have the same problem. When I say we, I'm talking about 
Bible-believing Christians, we have the same problem that other people have. We, unfortunately, have been influenced by our surroundings, influenced by our culture. And we take pride in that. Well, you know us Alabama boys. And oh, Wait, what about Christians? You may be an Alabama boy, but what should rule? Your Christianity, your faith in Christ, or the fact that you're a good old redneck. What should determine how you speak? It ought to be in righteousness. Amen. So he starts out saying to the congregation, do you speak righteousness? Not what is right in your eyes, because what is right in your eyes may not be righteous at all. That was the problem with God's people throughout the scripture, but especially in the book of Judges. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So when it comes to justice, it's not a matter about judging according to what's right in our eyes, but what's right in his eyes, in God's eyes. Their evil was in the sight of the Lord, even though it was right in their own eyes. That never produces justice. And then, do you judge uprightly is basically what he's saying here. He says at the end, well, that's what he says. Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? I'm reminded of God's giving his instruction to Israel before they ever got into the promised land. In Exodus 23, verses 1 and 2, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Now get this. Boy, this is so relevant for today. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. You go up to New York City and you've got people like the mayor up there who's led the city to defund the police, $1 billion. In punishment for what? And who's being punished after all? The good citizens of New York. They're not going to have any safety. The police are taking away. Well, but we know some bad police. Well, I got news for you. There's bad everywhere. All right. But for the most part, the police in the United States are head and shoulders above most other countries in the world. I know when we were down in Mexico visiting uh, with the missionaries, we made many, many trips down there. And one of the things you learn that is, if somebody breaks into the house and steals something, they don't call the police. The reason they don't call the police, they're afraid the police will come in and see something they would like and come back and steal that themselves. You know, we call the police here. Yeah, there have been bad apples. There have been bad apples in every group that's out there. But the police are not the enemy here. Politicians are more the enemy than anything else to good order in this nation because they don't understand justice. You got the mayor in Seattle. Do you remember when people came in by violence and by force, they take over part of the city property that's not theirs. They didn't pay for it. Uh, it, it wasn't theirs. And they kicked everybody else out and she wouldn't even let the police go in and straighten it out. But that changed. And you know what made it change? It wasn't the fact that a couple of people were killed in their chop zone. What changed was the protesters marched on her house. Nothing about justice there. You can do whatever you want as long as you leave me alone. I don't care what you do to anybody else. I don't care what other people you wrong. That's basically what the mayor of Seattle was saying. And who knows, she'll probably get reelected. But then, after asking the questions, do you speak righteousness and do you judge uprightly, he then gives both the source of, his, of the wickedness and the scope of the wickedness. Uh, he mentions here in verse 2, Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. That's the source. That's where it began. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. One of the big themes of today in our culture is trust your own heart. Live according to your own heart. But there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Bible says, he that trusteth his heart is a fool. Right, right. Man, trust the word of God. The word of God is right in all things. You want to know what's right and righteous? You go to the Bible, not your feelings. Your feelings will ruin your life. Your feelings will ruin your marriage. Your feelings will ruin your, ruin your relationship with your young people. But what's right yes. is the word of God. 
You can count on his truth. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. See, wickedness and violence, a bitter irony of these judges, judges using the scales of justice to deal out injustice, is the worst kind of violence. Then you've got the wicked for what they are, verses 3 through 5. He says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know, you don't have to teach a child how to lie. Isn't that funny? No one ever has to teach them how to lie. Lying is natural. Because we come forth from the womb speaking lies. But you do have to teach them how to tell the truth. And you do have to teach them how to do right. You don't have to teach them how to sneak. Sneaking is natural. Disobedience is natural. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. You know, the liberals try to want you to believe that, hey, there's good in everybody. No, there's evil in everybody. And overcome that. You see, we all go, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. You say, well, why is that? Go back to Adam and Eve. Man fell, man sinned. And from that time on, man's had the sin problem with him. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Uh, so they're born sinners, and their poison sickens and kills. In verse 4, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stopped with her ear. The poisonous serpents that sicken and kill. He makes an interesting term here, the deaf adder. Now, many of the commentators believe he's ta they're talking about a cobra. But why would they say the deaf adder? Do you realize snakes don't hear? They don't hear. They can feel vibrations in the ground. They don't hear it. There was a... There was a, uh, a radio station up in Detroit, Michigan. This is probably 20 years ago. It was an easy listening station. And they wanted to advertise their easy listening music and how soothing that it was. And so they had one of their announcers seated in a room on a stool where there were the, the floor was covered with snakes, supposedly poisonous snakes. And he's holding a boom box and he's saying, I'm playing the music of, and he mentioned the call letters for the radio station, to soothe these wild beasts, and that's why I'm not afraid. And right at that time, he moved awkwardly. The boom box fell to the floor and broke. And the last scene is him looking up at the camera. <laughs> well, they had, to, they had to take the commercial off the air because it actually sent some people into having uh, seizures. Because there are some people who are so afraid of snakes that they couldn't take the sight of. Now, when that went on the news, one of the things that they said about it was their music couldn't soothe the, the, those snakes anyway because the snakes can't hear. You say, well, what about, what about those snake charmers that play their music? Do you know what makes the snake come up? It's not, it's not the music. It's the movement of the pipe that the guy's playing. He doesn't just sit here and play. He's doing this in very rhythmic motions. Now, wait a second. Once you get this, they're like the deaf, deaf adder that stop with the servant, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Because it's not about the sound. And the thing about a cobra is that cobra can get distracted real easily. And when they do, they can bite and kill. And that is exactly how he is looking at these people. That's, that's exactly what he's calling them. They're deaf adders. That if the charmer doesn't charm them exactly right, take away their football, take away their booze, take away their drugs, and you're going to have them barking back at you. I mean, I still can't believe <coughs> that they opened up sports in Alabama. There's absolutely no way that football can be played without touching one another. Without every play. And by the way, if your quarterback's throwing the ball, do you really want to catch it? <coughs> That's nice and loud, isn't it? I need some water. Can you imagine that? But we're doing it. 
Somebody on ESPN mentioned the other day, I believe it was ESPN, mentioned, you know why they're starting back now? So they can get it, get immune, and then play. And there's already a number of players who have already tested positive. They know what they're doing. They need the money. It's not about safety. It's about money. See, justice is down because truth has fallen in the streets. So he talks about justice being violated, justice and judgment. And so you get to verse six and he goes to pray. Now, this is David. He goes to pray and look at how he starts out. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Because these people use their mouth to devour people. Hey, there's an awful lot that's gone on. I'm I'm not talking about proper, legitimate protest. But with all the looting and all that stuff that's going on, I guarantee you there's been a lot of cursing and yelling and some of the stuff that they say in those microphones is absolutely atrocious. They have no idea about what justice and judgment is. They say one thing with their mouth and the people that they condemn, man... It's amazing. Now you talk, you you look at David with that second statement he makes. He says, break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. David understood lions. Remember, he killed a lion and a bear when he was a youth. He had no doubt had been protecting the flock of his family as he was out there caring for the sheep. There's no doubt he had to deal with uh, with lions. When you hear the bleeding of the sheep, as a lion would go after them with their mouth, they would tear them up. I'll tell you what, break out their teeth. Without teeth, they can't do near as much, that's for sure. But you take those that pervert justice, their words are law. Thousands of babies are going to die now in Louisiana because their words are law. It's not justice. It's not proper judgment. It is wicked. It is murder. It is ungodly. But they're in power and they can. He says, break their teeth, O God. That doesn't sound very loving. That's not father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Break their teeth, O God. I don't know about you, but I I don't want to watch any of the 24-hour news stations. You hear so much garbage on there, some of the things these people are saying. And, and you would think if they were rational people, there's no way that they would say anything like a number of the things that they're saying. And what's really amazing is some of these politicians back them up. Their words, words do destroy and words do kill. And then he makes another statement. He says, let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his, and, and then he says, when he bendeth his bow to shoot arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. Now, and let them melt away as waters which run continually. You go over to the, uh, the wilderness part of Canaan. And you would see there that there are wadis in those desert places that are dry until there's a rainfall. And when there's a big rainfall, those things suddenly fill up and they do damage to anything that's in the way. But then the waters continually run. It's not long. They're all gone and it's dry again. And he's saying, let them just dry up. Let the looters just dry up. Let their, uh, let their, uh, uh, their wickedness just come to an end. Seems to be continual now, but... Let it come to an end. Get an idea of what he's praying. Uh, May they become a powerless bow. That's the idea. Uh, When he says, when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. Now, that's not the bows, but the arrows. An arrowless bow can't hurt anybody. It's not going to kill anybody. And that's what he wants for these people doing injustice And not following justice. And then he makes another interesting statement. He says, as a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman. As a snail which melteth. Now the idea is a snail, and you know a snail as it crawls along a surface like a wall or a fissure in a wall, it leaves a trail. 
it secretes stuff that leaves a trail. But if it doesn't get to a place where there's some moisture, eventually it just dries up and it dies. Now the shell remains there, but he says, as the snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Now he's down to some serious praying right here, asking God to break their teeth, asking them to become effective no more, asking for them to uh, be like a snail. That's kind of gross right there. And then like the untimely birth of a woman that they may not see the sun. The thing about expecting a child is that there is the prospect of life and a full life and a useful life and all of that. But for them, he wants it to end for them. That's his desire. And he's taking it to the Lord. And as far as I know, it's still not against the law to pray whatever you pray to God. Now, this is serious praying. And you say, uh, my, by the way, in verse 9, he says, Before your pots can fill the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. So he's given us a number of pictures. And this one about the, your pots, can, before they can fill the thorns, the idea here is of a traveler who has traveled all day and he's wore out and he's hungry and he's come to the end of the day. And so he uses his utensils, his pots, and there he's making a nice supper for himself to be able to get some nourishment. And he can smell it cooking and all of that. He's getting ready for some sustenance here at the end of the day. And a whirlwind comes and catches it away before he can enjoy the fruit of his labor. That's his desire. That's what he wants for them. So, and by the way, in verse 9, he's basically saying, here's what God's going to do. God is going to take away everything that you're working up. On the basis of his prayer, perhaps. After all, David often believed that God heard his cry when he called. And here, David has prayed to the Lord for those who are pushing their wickedness and their injustice. Now, how should you respond to a prayer like that? I mean, after all, the preacher got up and said, folks, we're going to pray. We are going to pray that God will break the teeth of every anchor on CNN. Amen, amen. <laughs> now, I'll guarantee you that if I said something like that, by the way, for those of you on the internet, don't get excited. I'm just giving an illustration. I'm not telling people to pray that. If they do, that's between them and the Lord. But I'm not telling people. To, but there'd be people who'd leave mad. There'd be people, man, they would be on the phone with their friends. They would be putting it on the internet. Brother Allison said, man, Brother Allison told people to pray that God would break the teeth of all those people on CNN, MN, and MSNBC, and NBC, and you just figure them out. How should the righteous respond to this type of praying? Well, verses 10 and 11 we see justice exalted. He says, the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. When God comes on the scene and intervenes, the righteous will rejoice. You see, we're not talking about people. We're not talking about people. Uh, this is not a prayer that says, uh, uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. First of all, I think they know what they're doing. This is the righteous rejoicing when God steps up and says, enough, I've had it. And he does exactly what David is praying. And you look at the second part of it. He says, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. This is the God of love now. Now wait, all right, let's go over to the book of Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we see Jesus coming back at the end of the tribulation, uh, coming back all the way to the earth. Notice verse 11. He says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, doesn't say in fairness, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes, speaking of Jesus, were as a flame of fire, 
And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's Jesus. The Bible says God's angry with the wicked every day. And what will the righteous do? They'll rejoice. As a matter of fact, it is what the righteous pray for. Go back to chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 6 in the book of Revelation. Now remember, David didn't say he was going to break their teeth. David is asking God to do it. David is asking God to have them like the snail that just melteth away. Notice, beginning in verse 9. Now, with the first eight verses, you have the opening of the first four seals of the scroll, being opened by Jesus himself. And with the first four, you get the scene of what's going down on earth at the beginning of the tribulation. When you get to the fifth seal, the scene changes to heaven. And notice, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Do you realize the martyrs in heaven are crying for God's vengeance? Upon those who put him to death. They're not praying, God forgive them. They know not what they do. So is God going to rebuke them? Here they are, they're in heaven to be so unloving. Wait. And the white robes were given, and white robes are given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, as they were, should be fulfilled. He said, They're calling for how long, Lord? And he says, just wait a little bit. It's coming. It's going to happen. Just wait. Isn't that interesting that the saints in heaven calling for God's judgment upon people? Well, God has a time and that judgment is coming. So the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. I didn't make it up. It's what it says. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Then, he says, so that a man shall say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. So we look at this, not only do the righteous rejoice, but God is praised. This kind of judgment causes the righteous to glorify God. They do not mourn the wicked. They glorify God. We need to understand that God is a just and righteous God, and His judgment is always according to true justice. There are 20 times where you find justice and judgment in the same verse in the Scripture. We're not going to look at all 20 of those. I'll not have you turn to them, but let me just give you a few of them. The first one is found in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19, where the Lord is getting ready to let David know about the destruction of, or not David, but Abraham know about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason he's going to do that, he says, for I know him, that's Abraham, that he will command his children and his household also to do justice and judgment. Abraham understood justice and judgment. Most people in churches don't have a clue about it. In 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 15, the Bible says David executed judgment and justice unto his people. In 1 Kings 10, 9, he's told to do just, our judgment and justice. In 1 Chronicles chapter 18 and verse 14, again of David, and executed judgment and justice among all his people. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 8, to do justice and judgment. Psalm 89 and verse 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. In Psalm 119, 121, uh, have done just judgment and justice. 
Leave me not to mine oppressors. In Proverbs 1, 3, do you realize one of the purposes for the giving of the book of Proverbs? Beginning in verse 2 of chapter 1, he tells us why the Proverbs were given. He says, beginning in verse 3, to know wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Because you see, most of mankind is totally ignorant of wisdom and justice and judgment and equity. We rule according to our feelings. We speak according to our feelings instead of according to his righteousness. In Isaiah 56 and verse 1, the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Proverbs 21 and verse 3, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Isaiah 59 and verse 14, we find that he lamented and judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off and truth is fallen in the streets. Is that not America today? Is that not exactly where we're at? Jeremiah 23 and verse 5, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Who is that king? That's King Jesus. He will execute justice and judgment. Not going to be any talk about what's fair. Going to be a lot of talk about what's right. And he will do not what's right in men's eyes. He will do what's right in the eyes of the true and holy and righteous God. You see, we do. I think since these psalms are given for us, I do believe this is proper praying for those who are perverting justice and judgment across our land. And people suffer because of it. It's proper praying. We don't take the law into our own hands. But we are responsible to pray correctly that our righteous and holy God is exalted and that our God move upon our nation. Maybe he'll be merciful to us and do exactly that and wipe out a lot of the injustice and stuff that's going on so we can continue a while longer. But if not, he's going to wipe it out in his time. He's coming back. Let's pray. Father. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. As we reread these verses, as we study them in the next day or so, help us to understand that this is righteous praying. This is praying for justice and for proper judgment because there's so little of it. So little of it. Dear God, please move upon us that when you do it, Lord, that we rejoice as we should. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen, and you're dismissed.